we decided to include a special one lecture on introduction to optimization. So, optimization is a mathematical tool. Uh, optimization is a very important mathematical tool that is often useful in a lot of areas, especially it has been widely applied in signal processing communication, controls, uh, a lot of related areas in the last 10, 15, 20 years. For this course also, uh, we have certain use of optimization, it is not immediately clear what exactly optimization, how exactly optimization comes into picture. So, hopefully that will be clear by the end of this lecture. So, let me proceed. So, this is the brief outline of what I will do. I will not cover the everything about optimization because there is a lot of mathematical details and lot of things that uh, you may not be aware of. So, I will what I will do is I will give you a brief introduction, brief overview and the rest uh, I will leave it up to you to go back and study depending on what you are, what part you are interested in. Uh, so, let us uh, come to a problem that we, me and Udaya worked on a uh, few months ago. So, this is related to the placement, optimal placement. So, you have been uh, looking at distributed storage so far. Uh, so, I hope you have some idea of what distributed storage is. Uh, we are formulating the problem. So, let us uh, just directly jump into the problem. If you are formulating, we are trying to formulate the problem of where to locate the uh, various blocks that we have. So, you have various. So, let us say if you are using RS1014, then you have 14 blocks of coded blocks and you have to place them somewhere, so that they are easily accessible, right? easily accessible in some sense. So, we will try to define then or make it regress what easily accessible means. So, the goal was to decide where to place the files or coded blocks of files. right? And to that end, uh, we decided to look at it in a more formal setting. So, instead of looking at it in the worst case scenario, where worst case where to place it, we just decided that okay, let us look at the problem in the sense that where to place it, given a certain number of files, where to place them. And therefore, uh, and to that end, we use the convex optimization framework. And the basic notion there was that you minimize an objective function. So, what is an objective function? In this case, you have to place the files so as to minimize certain aspect that you are interested in. For example, you may be interested in delay. right? So, delay that comes in for a user to access a file. So, if a user clicks on a file, he will get some, there will be some coding and decoding delay in consequently associated with that coding and decoding delay. Behind the scenes, there will be some fetching delay, there will be some delay uh, required for fetching the files from various locations, especially if, if it is a large distributed cluster. So, imagine a cluster that is uh, distributed over a large region such as Australia. Hmm? So, there are thousands of kilometers. So, you have to, to fetch them takes a few hundreds of milliseconds. And uh, so, ideally, you would want everything to be located as close as the user is, but that is not always possible because users themselves are distributed, right? So users themselves are distributed. So you would want them to be want these blocks to be distributed. So for example, you may want to minimize the delay. Another option is that if I am talking to someone who owns this company uh, or who buys distributed storage, uh, he may be paying for bandwidth each time a user clicks some file is being downloaded on some backbone link and therefore, someone may be paying for this bandwidth and that, that is associated with a cost. You know, you can measure that cost in uh, dollars. And then you could also have it in more abstract economics sense. So, there is a cost, there is a uh, delay and therefore, you can have a combination of them and call it utility. So, what is the utility for a customer? A customer is happy not paying too much cost but he is not very happy if he has to wait for a long time. So, you combine the two into one and call it a utility. This, this utility idea is very common in the context of economics. So, everything you associate with utility and then work with a utility. So, anyway, this is the brief overview or vague idea of what we were trying to do. We are trying to minimize this quantity, whatever this quantity is. So, you are trying to place the blocks such that this quantity is minimized. And to this end, we utilize the framework of optimization. So, we used we formulated this problem in the context of convex optimization and use tools from convex optimization to solve this problem. Right? So, as opposed 
as opposed to a black box that gives you such a solution. The advantage of using this convex optimization framework is that you have uh, strict performance guarantees. Right? So, it is not that something that you plug in the numbers and it will give you the output. More than that, it will also give you guarantees as to when this will work and when it will not work. Right? So, exact guarantees are available. So, this is generally true for any convex optimization problems. Uh, problem. It is not true, however, for other some other optimization frameworks such as genetic optimization. So, in genetic optimization, for example, which is different from convex optimization, there is less, the, it is not easy to get guarantees, theoretical guarantees as to when this thing will work and when it will not work. It is mostly like hit and trial. It sometimes it works and they are very happy and then sometimes it does not work. As opposed to that, convex optimization generally gives you a intuition about the problem. You are able to understand the problem in a more deeper sense and therefore, you are able to use it to other settings as well. So, overall the convex optimization is a useful tool in the, all these areas and uh, these slides will include lot of material and I am sure that some of you will look it up later on. So, all the references are included. Okay. So, this let us come to the optimization framework. So, this is a this is how uh, mathematical optimization uh, looks like. So, generally if you have any design problem or almost any design problem, you can express it like this. You can express it as minimizing something subject to some constraints. The constraints are of the form some function is less than some quantity, some constant or 0 sometimes we say some function is less than equal to 0. So, constraints can always be written in this form. So, while any design problem can be written like an optimization problem does not mean that optimization problems are easy in any way. I mean optimization problems are also hard and generally if you look at an arbitrary random optimization problem, it will be hard. It is a very, very small class of problems referred to as convex optimization problems which are easy. So, convex optimization problems are easy, general optimization problems are hard. So, in this slides, I will tell you how to identify whether a problem is convex or not. And beyond this, the next step which I will not cover in detail here is what to do if a problem is actually non-convex. So, what people do is they try to apply convex optimization ideas to problems which are actually non-convex. Right? Use tools from convex optimization, develop similar kind of guarantees. Right? So, there are two steps generally if you have a non-convex problem. So, in an optimization problem, these are the so called optimization variables x1, x2, xn. There is an objective function associated that is uh, something that you want to minimize and there are constraint functions associated that you may want to uh, adhere to. So, constraints in our case for example, we have already talked about optimization objective, objective was delay or uh, cost and the constraints could be that uh, you know your placement should be valid, it should not be invalid, not everything should be placed at one location, something like that could be a constraint and the optimal solution x star is the one that has the smallest value of f naught of x among all x that satisfy this constraints. Generally, there can be many such constraints. So, in general, so there is something for someone, some of you may have heard. In general, if you look at such an optimization problem, the complexity of solving such an optimization problem is what? In general, give you an arbitrary optimization problem unless it has any special structure, the complexity of solving such an optimization problem will be exponential in, it will be exponential in n and m, it will be exponential in n and m. So, this means that if n is 20, you already have something, some complexity, even if you can solve that with 20, it doubles or becomes some constant factor of times at 21 and then it becomes double at 22. So, quickly it becomes impossible to solve problems which are greater than 30, 40, 50 etcetera. Whatever you can solve just increasing by, by 1 increases the complexity by or doubles the complexity. On the other hand, for convex that is not the case. The complexity is in fact, generally for most software the complexity is approximately n cube or m cube. Okay. So, as opposed to exponential it is polynomial. 
So, just a little bit of background. So, we will start with the basic definition of a convex set. So, set I am talking about let us say a 2D or 3D or n dimensional set, a geometric quantity. Uh, so, is a set is convex if a line segment between any two points in C lies in C. So, you take any two points, draw a line, that line entirely belongs to that set, then we say that that set is convex, right. This is an example. So, you have x1, x2, you draw a line, line is already inside this set. So, therefore, this set is convex. This set is not a convex set, right. Then the more examples, so formal definition is that if x1 is a point in n dimension, x2 is a point in n dimension, then theta x1 plus 1 minus theta x2 is a line, is a point on the line that passes between, uh, passes through x1 and x2 for theta between 0 and 1. So, just uh, if you put theta equal to 0, it will become x2 and if you put theta equal to 1, it will become x1. So, x1, x2 are two extreme points and every point in between is covered by theta between 0 and 1, right. So, this is for example, so this is a line and we want all these points to belong to the set if x1, x2 belongs to the set. And uh, a counter example or an example that does not satisfy this equation is the set of all numbers in n dimension such that each of these x i's x1, x2, x3 are either 0 or 1. So, they are either 0 or 1, but not in between. So, why is this not a convex set? We are talking about all points, we are talking about discrete set of points, a set constructed by discrete points, they are either 0 or 1 and nothing in between. So, therefore, if you draw a line, that line will be entirely outside the set. The set only contains the extreme points 0 or 1, right. So, therefore, it is not a convex set. So, convex sets are easy to deal with, non-convex sets are hard to deal with. Another example is the Euclidean ball. This is something that uh, if you have some linear algebra background, you should be able to prove that everything, every line that you draw inside a ball will stay inside the ball. No way that the line can go outside. Uh, and you know lots of operations if you do on convex sets, they will preserve convexity example is uh, intersection scaling etcetera. So, if you if you scale a set, it will stay convex. If you increase its size, just stretch it in any direction, it will stay convex. Okay. Then we come to the next part, which is convex functions. So, convex function is any function for which the secant line Right, the line joining two points on the function is above the function. So, line is above the function. Mathematically, you can state it like this, the function is below the line. So, the secant is above the function, that is the definition of a convex function. Note that this definition is called the zeroth order definition, because it does not assume that f is differentiable also. f can be anything, it can be non-differentiable anything this definition should always work and if this definition holds, then we say that f is convex. Right. So, this is the definition of a convex set, convex function and uh, in a similar way, we define concave function. So, concave function is nothing but a minus of the convex function. So, if a function is concave, then you just check whether minus of that function is convex or not, right. So, in other words, the secant line will be below the function. There is another easier definition, you could say easier in some cases. In some cases, this definition is hard. Uh, an easier definition in some cases is just check whether the second derivative of the function is non-negative or not. Right. So, second derivative represents the curvature. So, all you need to do is check whether the second derivative is positive or not. Similarly, for concave, you will check whether second derivative is negative or not. So, there are many examples. This is a single dimension, one dimensional example. So, what is, you know, what can you say about A x plus B? What can we say about A x plus B in one dimension, single line? 
So, is it convex or concave? Second derivative of Ax plus b is 0, right. So, it is both you could say it is non negative also and non positive also. So, it is both convex and concave that is only the property of line that it is convex and concave both. For any other function let us say x square what is it? Second derivative is 2 x 2 right second derivative is 2. So, it is convex e raised to power a x is what? Second derivative is a square which means that a can either be positive or negative a square is always positive. So, it is always convex. So, whether you are talking about e raised to power x or e raised to power minus x both are convex and there are other examples I mean just check it out for example, your uh, entropy function is also also has this property it is concave. For higher dimension it this a definition is slightly con complicated because there is no notion of positivity. So, you not only require things to be positive you also require this entire hessian matrix to be positive semi definite and the hessian matrix should be positive semi definite. What does that mean? Anyone has heard of this term positive semi definite matrix. So, you have a matrix whose ijth entry is second derivative of f partial derivative of f with respect to x i x j right del square f del x i del x j right. You construct this matrix right what you want is to be positive semi definite. What does that mean? It means that eigenvalues of this matrix right, all are positive right. Positive, positive definite means eigenvalues are positive, positive semi definite means that eigenvalues can either be 0 or positive. So, they have to be non negative. Uh, so, this definition like works in n dimensions. So, n dimension if you learn a little bit about linear algebra in n dimension then it starts to fit in place. For example, if you have an affine function uh, a transpose x plus b then you can check or you have a quadratic function x transpose a x right. So, if you have x transpose a x then the hessian is given by a and this is positive semi definite when a is positive semi definite. So, you just have to take a, put a to be a constant positive semi definite matrix and you have a convex function convex quadratic function. This is a property that is uh, an important part of realizing why we prefer convex what is the relationship between convex sets and convex functions. Convex functions we are talking about functions of the form f of x sets we were talking about sets of points in n dimensional space. So, what is the relationship? The relationship is that if f is convex then its sub level set is also convex right. If f is convex its sub level set is also convex. So, let us take a simple example. Let us say we are talking about f x equal to x square right. f x equal to x square how does it look? It looks like this. What is the set x? What is the set x? such that f x is less than equal to 0, this is it is uh, just 0, it has only one point. Let us say look at uh, look, look at a function let us look at this function instead, this is more interesting. So, we are looking at a function f x equal to x square minus 4, what is the set x? such that x square minus 4 is less than equal to 0 x between minus 2 and 2 right. So, what you do is you draw a line this is the line where x equal to 0 right and this is f of x on this axis. Then this interval this interval is the sub level set right this is the set I have written here. So, is this interval a convex set? This is a one dimensional example of a set right. It contains all the points from here to here draw any line between any two points it will all be inside this set right. 
and basic same idea basically applies to a higher dimension. Any convex set that you take in n dimensions, you will get a set in that many dimensions and that set will always be convex. So, the sub level set is always convex and uh, this means that if we have a convex function, the set of points that are feasible. So, let us go back and look at our uh, optimization problem. If f i of x is convex, what can you say, say about the set of points x such that they satisfy f i of x less than equal to b? That set is convex. So, feasible region, the set of all feasible points is convex because f i of x is convex. Right? So, this is the link between convex set and convex functions. You have a convex function, you can always cut it at some point, form the sub level set, that sub level set will always be convex set and therefore, you are still in the convex domain, I mean this, you have not gone outside the convex domain. For functions, you do not necessarily have to rely on these two properties only, you can rely at other properties also. Uh, for example, some operations that preserve convexity are these non-negative weighted sum, just add functions, keep on adding convex functions, they will all, the sum will also be convex or if you keep on adding concave functions, the sum will also be concave and so on. Uh, you can add or multiply a positive constant that will not affect. Point wise maximum is also a convex function. What I mean to say is that you take the maximum, at every point you take maximum of two functions that resulting function will also be convex. For example, here I drew two convex functions and at every point I took the maximum which is this black one and interestingly that is also convex. And there are like many, many operations, many mathematical tricks that you need to remember if you want to check whether something is convex or not. Uh, so, I, I have this void is the name of a book that I have included in the references. So, we will come to the convex optimization problems. So, this is the set of the standard form of for convex optimization problems is as follows. You can have, you have a objective function minimize f naught of x and certain constraints, inequality constraints f i of x less than equal to 0 all these functions should be convex for this to be a convex problem in standard form. Note that sometimes you may have a constraint of the form something is greater than 0. What will you do in that case? Just multiply that constraint by minus 1. So, you get minus of function is less than equal to 0 and that becomes that comes back to the standard form. So, all constraints should be expressed first in the standard form. That is, this is not only a requirement for convenience. So, not only is it convenient to assume that everything is written like this, but uh, if you write it in soft software, they will require you to express your constraint in a particular form, so that they can solve your problem. So, that form is generally this one. And the second thing is that you cannot have non-linear equality constraints. The convex standard form does not allow non-linear equality constraints, it only allows this kind of equality constraints A x equal to B that you cannot have x square equal to 1 for example. Right? A constraint of the form x square equal to 1 means x is equal to plus minus 1 which is a non-convex constraint. Right? Two points, isolated points, the line between them does not lie inside the set. So, x square equal to 1 is not a convex constraint. So, x square less than 1 is a convex constraint because it includes all the point between minus 1 and 1. Right? So, if you want to include a equality constraint, it has to be linear or affine, this is called affine A x equal to b or A x plus b equal to 0. So, objective function should be convex, constraint set should be convex and the constraint set to be convex includes all these kinds of functions. Right? So, this is your standard convex optimization problem. If you have a problem at hand, you know how to check whether functions are convex or not, you just plug in the formulas and check whether f naught is convex, f i is convex. If it turns out to be convex, you are done. You have a problem in convex form 
any standard algorithm can be used to solve it. Right? So, as soon as you identify a convex problem, it is no longer a difficulty. Any, any, many software are available for solving such convex problems. But the trick here, what is the trick? The trick here is that for many problems, they appear to be non-convex in the sense that you will try to arrange f i of x is less than equal to 0 in convex form, but you will not be able to or, or you it turns out that your constraint is not followed. But if you play with it a little bit, you may still be able to turn it into convex form. This means that whether a problem is convex or not or in other words, whether a problem is easy to solve or not is highly dependent on the formulation itself, the way you formulate the problem. So, let me give you an example. Let us say I have a constraint of the form log x less log x greater than equal to oh, let us say log x less than equal to 1. So, an example where the where this, this if you apply it mindlessly it will not work. So, I have a constraint of the form log x less than equal to 1. Now, if I do not pay attention to it, I will see oh I need f i of x less than equal to 0. So, let me write log x minus 1 less than equal to 0, but what kind of function is log x? What is the derivative of log x? 1 by x, what is the second derivative? Minus 1 by x square, minus 1 by x square is always negative, which means that it is a concave function, but the standard form does not allow concave less than equal to 0, it requires convex less than equal to 0, right? Standard form requires convex less than equal to 0, but we have concave less than equal to 0. Right. So, this function is not allowed, right? it is concave and therefore, problem looks non-convex. Not only that, if you put it in a software, a software will give you error, there is a non-convex problem, what are you doing? So, but the obvious thing to realize is that you, if you play with it, this constraint is equivalent to what? log x less than equal to 1 means x less than equal to when is log x less than equal to 1 x less than equal to e right and of course x has to be positive for this to be defined because if x is negative this will become complex doesn't mean anything complex less than equal to 1 doesn't mean anything so x has to be between 0 and e or 2 if you are taking log 2 so, what kind of constraint is x between 0 and 2? So, x between uh, let us say right, what kind of constraint is this? It is a convex constraint because it is an interval. If you have an interval, it is a convex constraint. So, you have here a simple convex constraint and it is needlessly complicated because of the formulation. Right, because of the way that you have formulated it. So, everything this is this was a very simple example, but this thing happens a lot. You will come across a complicated probability expression, let us say probability of error for a uh, communication channel and the requirement is that probability of error should be less than equal to 10 power minus 6 and if you do not simplify it that probability of error expression contains some q function, it is very complicated if you try to find its derivative, second derivative will not even succeed proving anything positive or negative. But if you look at it carefully, try to play with it, in many cases we have been able to, there have been lot of papers on this actually, converting these kind of constraints into a convex form. Sometimes you may have to make an approximation, so you will have to assume that okay, you know SNR is high and therefore in that case this is a convex function. For example, this log 1 plus S i n r, right? It, it becomes lots of people have taken approximation, high S n r approximation. As soon as you take high S n r approximation, things become concave. Otherwise, log 1 plus S i n r is some not concave. Okay, so that is like one big area of 
trying to find, trying to formulate your problem, trying to mold it, trying to approximate it, so that you can solve it using convex optimization tools. This is a linear program, it's an example of one of the oldest convex optimization problems. In fact, convex optimization itself has a history in linear programming. So, linear programming was the first one that they tried to solve. They used to solve it near the world war, world war II. Uh, this has applications, lot of applications in logistics and freight planning and so on. So, here you just have a linear constraint, linear inequalities, linear equalities, everything. Right? The, if you look at it geometrically, it looks like this. In fact, this A1 transpose x less than equal to d, this is represented by a half space and it's an intersection of several half spaces. So, I will not go into the geometry too much, just so that you do not get confused. Uh, another, in fact, the I would say the oldest problem that people have been trying to solve uh, all the way starts all the way from Gauss uh, is the least squares problem. You, have all, you all know about least squares from an estimation perspective at least, uh, but you can also look at it from an optimization perspective. You have essentially have a objective function that you want to minimize, there are no constraints. right? You have an objective function that you want to minimize and you have no constraints and moreover the objective function y minus a x norm square is a convex function of x. The norm square whenever you have a norm of a linear term, you have a convex function. So, you have a convex function in x and you know you know all these things, you know what is the solution. For example, if a is square and full rank, then just invert a and get that solution and the objective value in that case will be 0. So, you know this, these cases you already know how to solve and uh, now if you know a little bit of convex optimization, you can additionally include constraints in this problem. You could say, oh I do not want x to be anything, I just want x to be between 0 and 1. So, you could say, oh x 1 is between 0 and 1, x 2 is between 0 and 1 and so on and then you just have to plug it into some software and so on. That will give you the solution of the constrained optimization problem. There is one very interesting notion which is that of duality that is associated with convex problems. Now, this becomes slightly mathematically slightly complex. So, it is something that you can skip for when you are reading it for the first time, but I will just introduce you in very rough. So, let us say that we have an arbitrary optimization problem. So, duality the notion of duality what it allows is that you have any arbitrary optimization problem convex or non-convex, it will give you a technique of providing a or developing a bound for that problem. So, you are minimizing something and with the use of duality, you can always develop a bound on the objective function, the best possible objective function that this can achieve. So, I will tell you the procedure but I will leave, leave the proof and why it works uh, for you to later read. So, in this case all you have to do is write the Lagrangian and the Lagrangian is written by associating Lagrange multiplier, the so called Lagrange multipliers or penalties to the constraint functions. So, I associate some lambda i, lambda 1 to lambda m to the inequality constraints and I associate nu 1 to nu m, nu p to the equality constraints and write down the Lagrangian. Now, the Lagrangian is something that it depends on both x and lambda. If I minimize the Lagrangian with respect to x, what will happen? If I minimize the Lagrangian with respect to x, I will get something that is a function of lambda. Right, because this term depends on both x and lambda. So, I minimize with respect to x. For every value of lambda, I choose the value of x that is the minimum possible. Right. By the way, Lagrangian is what kind of function in x? If this problem is convex, is Lagrangian a convex function of x? Is if f naught of x is convex, f i of x is convex, h x is f i, in which case this will be a convex problem, then Lagrangian will be a convex function as long as lambda i is positive. Similarly, Lagrangian is what kind of function of lambda and nu? It is a linear function of lambda and nu, right? Lagrangian depends on 
lambda and nu in a linear fashion. So, the result is that if you minimize this with respect to x, you will get a function of lambda and nu. We call it the dual function and it turns out that whether your original problem is convex or not, your dual function is always concave. Concave, yes. In fact, uh, the, the Lagrangian is affine in lambda and nu and because we are taking point wise minimum of several affine functions, it is a concave function. It looks like this. There are infinite such lines and therefore, this one looks like an affine function. So, the dual function is always concave. So, whenever you have a minimization problem, whether convex or concave, the dual function is always concave. Therefore, you can always optimize the dual function. You can find the maximum of that dual function and the maximum of that dual function is always below the minimum of the primal problem. So, the, the primal is your original problem dual is your modified problem where you found the Lagrangian minimized it, wrote it as a function of lambda. right? So, this is our duality. The primal function may behave like this with respect to x, the dual function may behave like this with respect to lambda and this is called the duality gap. This is a gap between the dual and the primal and this gap is 0 when can anyone guess when is this gap 0? It is 0 when the problem is convex. So, whenever you have a convex problem, this gap becomes 0. So, for convex optimization problems, you can either solve the primal problem or you can play with it, convert it into dual form and solve the dual problem. Both optimum are same. And in fact, that is what many of the state of the art software solvers do they solve the problem using primal and dual. In fact, what they do is they solve it iteratively. They start from point which is primal or primal, right? some point x. They find a lambda point corresponding to that. They keep on going. right? So, they start from one point like this. They keep on going like this. If the problem is convex, this gap is going to be 0 right? and that allows them to check whether they are close to optimum or not. So, if this gap gap between these two points is almost 0, then they will declare that okay, they have solved the problem. Right? So, just a brief glimpse into how actually convex problems are solved. So, I will just skip this. So, this is the basically the what I was saying lower bound property. <coughs> the primal whatever point in the primal is always above the dual. So, I will just skip all the mathematics here. It's uh, it is a bit complicated. So, you have to really think about it and understand it. Uh, it is not enough time for me to cover it here, but I am just giving you an introduction that this is an important property. Uh, at the end of the slides, I have included an example. Here also there is an example. At end of the slides, I have included a more familiar example which is related to water filling and that water filling example you can read at your leisure and try to understand it, solved uh, using duality. Before concluding, just want to present one more class of problems. They look very, very different from convex optimization problems, but they are actually intricately linked. They are the so called geometric programs. We use geometric programs in our work, so I am just thinking that it is also useful for uh, you. So, it is a type of mathematical optimization problem with objective and constraints in a special form. There is a special form for objective and constraints. The importance here is that they are very general, they include a lot of problems that are seemingly non convex. You will think the first sight you will look at in them and you will think that the problem is non convex, but if you think about it carefully, you will find that sometimes it is geometric, uh, it adheres to this notion of geometric program, and, uh, and a number of problems are well approximated by GPs. Uh, so, it is basically involved some creativity into converting a problem into GP form and recognizing whether it is a GP or not. So, to this end, let us just introduce some uh, definitions. So, a monomial is a function of this form. Just you have some variables raised to the power something times a constant. Right? So, x or x by y why is x by y a monomial? Because it is y raised to power something, y raised to power minus 1 or minus 0.5. 
right. So, these all these functions are monomials, they are just one term out of a, if you write a multiple such terms, then it becomes a polynomial. So, you sum up many monomials, it becomes a polynomial. Remember however, that we do not allow these things to be negative, the exponents can be negative, minus 0.12 is fine, but the this term, this term should not be negative. So, all positive quantities, these are all also positive quantities. So, polynomial is a sum of monomials. Also, if you are, if you have f and g that are monomials, if you multiply two monomials, it will be a monomial. If you divide f by g, then also it will be a monomial. 1 by f is also a monomial and so on. Uh, you have to be careful about this kind of terms. Minus 1.1 is not a monomial because minus sign is there. 1 plus x y raised to power 3.1 is also not a monomial, right, because it is not a sum of polynomial, it is not, it's not some uh, variable raised to power something, 1 plus is there inside. However, if you had 1 plus x y cube, then you would have expanded it, you would have written it as 1 plus x cube y cube plus 3 x square y square and so on, that would have been a polynomial, but because you have 3.1 it will not. Uh, and similarly, this is not a polynomial because minus 2 z is there and the GP in standard form is this one. So, notice the difference from the convex problems, in this we do not require things to be convex, instead we require f naught of x to be a polynomial, f i phi of x to be polynomial and g i of x to be a monomial. So, the inequality constraint should be polynomials, equality constraint should be monomials, right. If you just look at it directly, it is non-convex, right. It is non-convex because in convex problems, we only allowed linear equalities. Here, we are saying that, you know, g i of x can be monomial. So, monomial x cube for example. So, x cube equal to 1 is not a convex constraint. By the way, there is an implicit constraint that all these x's are positive, negative or not allowed. Still, x cube equal to 1 is not a convex constraint. Similarly, if I say some arbitrary sum of monomials less than equal to 0, that will not be a convex constraint. So, this is not convex, but the key idea is that it can be converted into a convex problem. How do you convert it into a convex problem? So, this is an example. So, x cube is monomial, so it is not convex. So, cannot be just cannot just say that f naught x is x cube because monomial is not convex. Uh, this is an example of a GP. You have a sum of polynomials, sum of monomials, each of these are monomial. For example, 2.3 x z is a monomial, and sum of monomials less than or equal to 1 sum of monomials less than or equal to 1 and monomial equal to 0, equal to 1. You can generally you will have problems of this form. So, you have to play with them a little bit to get into this form. For example, how will you get into this form? How will you get into the form that you minimize a polynomial subject to polynomial less than or equal to 1 and monomial equal to 1? just multiply with whatever you need to. For example, when you have x less than or equal to 3, you can write it as x by 3 less than or equal to 1. So, that is your polynomial less than or equal to 1. x greater than or equal to 2, what will you write it as? Hmm? You cannot use minus polynomial, monomial did not allow minus sign. So, what will you write it as? You can write it as, you can still divide. So, you write it as 2 by x less than or equal to 1, uh, yeah, 2 x inverse less than or equal to 1. Similarly, here you have square root y on this side, but I want 1 on this side, right. So, I, st I can still divide. So, I divide everything by square root y, I get this less than or equal to 1. So, any GP you should be able to express it in this form, that is the basic condition. If you are able to express it in this form, you can solve it. And essential idea behind why you can solve GPs is that 
there you can convert them into the convex form. And because of this result, you can solve very large GPs. You can solve GPs with 1000 variables, even more. If you have a special structure, you can solve GPs with even larger number of variables. So, the convex form is as follows. How to convert them into convex form? First of all, you are minimizing f naught of x. It is the same as minimizing log of f naught of x. Why? Because log is a monotonic function. If you minimize a function, you can minimize instead its log. There is no problem minimizing log. Also, we introduce a change of variables, which is that x i tilde equal to log of x i. What does this mean? x i tilde equal to log of x i, it means that x i equal to e raised to power x i tilde. So, wherever you had some x, you in introduce e raised to power something. So, what will happen to the monomials that we had? We had man many monomials here, right? So, all the monomials will become, so we'll, let us say you have some x z, uh, what will happen to it? It will become e raised to power x tilde plus z tilde. Right, all these monomials will become e raised to power something. So, and this kind of polynomial constraint x square y plus square root z will become something like this log e raised to power 2 x tilde plus y tilde plus e raised to power z tilde by 2 less than equal to uh, 0. 0 because you have taken log. Okay. So, log of 1 is 0. The monomial constraint x cube z equal to 1 becomes 3 x tilde plus z tilde equal to 0. So, this one becomes affine. Remember that we allowed monomial equal to 1, so which translates to affine equal to 0, which is what we required, right. And the second thing that we required was this side to be convex. So, it turns out that log e raised to power something plus e raised to power something, this kind of function is always convex. So, this kind of function is always convex. You always have from polynomials, you always have convex less than equal to 0. From monomial constraint, you always have define equal to 0. So, that is your answer as to why geometric programs are convex, or how to convert geometric programs into convex forms. So, this is all the references, and uh, I hope I have some time. I will just give you a quick demo of the software we use to solve this kind of problems, so that you can run it on your own. The software is included in this website. If you go to this website, uh, you will find the software. The so, software is part of MATLAB. Just install it on MATLAB and uh, if whenever you see a problem, you think it is convex, you plug it in and you should be able to run it and it will give you an output. However, uh, one caution that I always give the students also that you must know that the problem is convex. If you try to plug in some arbitrary problem, it will give you some error which you will not understand what this means. Uh, and therefore, you will think that you know maybe you are not able to make it work. But generally, the problem is that the whatever problem you gave it, it is not convex. So, you have to be sure that it is convex. If you are sure that it is convex, then software will work. But if you are not sure, then the software may not work and you will not know. I will just show you the in, so this file I can circulate with you. I will show you just in a simple example. I have some coefficients and the format of this software is very simple. It is simply that you write it as C V X begin variable and minimize and you include whatever objective you have. Do not have to worry about uh, writing it in, uh, I mean this just have to be compatible with MATLAB. So, C transpose into x is our objective right? and uh, subject to and some constraints like sum of x equal to equal to 1, right? x greater than equal to 0. When I say vector x greater than equal to 0, it automatically interprets it as each element of x being greater than equal to 0 and that is it. That is your program. So, this is the software running. It is telling you that it is 10 variables, 1 inequality constraints and it is telling you the exact algorithm that is being used behind the scenes to solve this. It is telling you the infeasibility, primal infeasibility, duality gap, primal objective, dual objective, everything it is telling you. As I mentioned, solving by some kind of primal dual method actually 
exactly it is called the interior point method and it will give you a lot of diagnostic information about your problem. In the end it will give you the solution, everything is just works as is you do not have to worry about anything as long as your problem is convex. So, if you understand that your problem is convex, you can just quickly in 10 minutes you can or maybe 2 minutes you can install and check whether it is giving the solution or not. Okay. So, that is it. So, it has other examples also it has uh, least squares, it has minimum norm solution, it has linear programming, it has water filling example also. Right. So, all these examples are here if you are interested you just go through all these examples you will understand it quickly. So, solving by CVX is something that you can understand quickly. The convex optimization theory is the one that takes time. Okay, thank you.